Thank you very much, and uh, I'd like to thank the Professor Shantanude and the, the department for inviting me here. It's my first time in India, and uh, I was very uh, interested in coming here, very interested in giving this uh, lecture. We'll be together for 10 days or something like this. I hope you will uh, enjoy it. Um, in this first part here this morning, it's really an introduction to combustion. I will recall uh, a number of things about why we have to study combustion, why it's important. Um, I just want to mention a few things. Uh, uh, during the course, it's really uh, uh, no problem if you want to stop me at any point. Since, you know, we're going to spend a lot of time together, if you are lost after the, the first five minutes, it's not a good idea. So please don't hesitate to say, oh, stop here. There's something I did not understand. I will stop and write things on the board to try to explain what's going on. Now, so uh, combustion <coughs> uh, is, of course, uh, 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 a very important topic today. Uh, before we, we start talking about combustion, there's two things I want to do. First, I want just to, to re reintroduce myself. You know, I didn't work in combustion all the time. I did a PhD on uh, tires when I was uh, your age, maybe. And so I started combustion later. So you can, you can begin combustion at any time, OK? You don't have to be born in a combustion world. You can start combustion later. So at the moment, some of you may have to meet me at some point. I'm the associate editor of Commercial and Flame. So if you submit papers to Commercial and Flame, you might have to, to talk to me. So this is the place where I'm working. This is France. Uh, it's small, OK? It's, uh, and uh, I'm working in Toulouse here, which is a city close to the, to the border. Uh, so before we, we go uh, into uh, the course itself, I would like to, to know who I'm talking to. So, uh, I'd like to do a small exercise here. Can you just please raise your hand if you have uh, studied combustion before? Okay, so that's not everyone, but that's a significant part of the audience. Huh? Uh, and who has studied classical aerodynamics? You know, lift, drag, flight mechanics. Okay, so that's basically the other guys. Huh? Um, who has done CFD? <laughs> And who has done experiments? Not too bad. OK. Uh, who is a PhD student here? Half of it. OK. And uh, who comes from industry? OK, fine. OK, so uh, that's the outline of the presentations. Uh, I may cover everything here or not, depending how fast we go. Uh, you may also come to talk to me and say, I would be very interested in these topics or this one, and I can adjust the, the, the program. So for this morning, uh, we're going to start here, okay? And that's uh, uh, the basic things to recall about combustion. Um, why, why is France working on combustion? You know, combustion is a very important topic in France. You probably know this aircraft. You know, this is the only supersonic aircraft which has been used, you know, uh, over the world in the last 50 years. There's no one, nothing left today like this. But this was basically a combustion problem too, first, because if you want to go to Mach 2, you have to be able to propel this aircraft. Now, <coughs> the place where I live in Toulouse is the place where we build the Airbuses. When I came here yesterday from Delhi, I was flying on an Airbus 321. That's it's coming from my city. And of course, we also do the 350 and the 380, which is the largest aircraft in the world today. To propel these things, you need engines. Engines in France are built by a company called Snecma, which is located in Paris. Uh, and uh, these are, those are, I would say, rather simple applications. If you want to do more complicated applications, you want to work on rockets. France is working on uh, liquid fuel rockets engines here near Paris, and also on solid propellant systems. All of them are used in rockets like those here. And here we are talking about powers, which are, of course, much more uh, complicated to reach. Uh, of course, combustion is something you need if you want to work on uh, cars. And France has many car companies working in that, on that problem. Those are, of course, not the engines you would use every day, but those are French engines. There are other places where combustion is important. Total, for example, if you work on, a, on a oil refinery, or if you work on problems of safety in buildings, you have to worry about combustion too. And so that explains why in France, uh, you have quite a few laboratories working in combustion. 
I'm just saying that because uh, many, we actually have, at the moment I have four uh, postdocs and two PhD coming from, from India. So that's a usual place to go if you want to work on, on combustion. Now just uh, two, two slides on advertisement here. As we said before, a lot of what I'm going to say is covered in this book here called Theoretical and Numerical Combustion. It's available on the web. You can also just buy an electronic access to the, to the book if you just want to, to use the electronic version, or you can buy the book. Uh, the reason I'm mentioning that is that because uh, many things I'm going to say today, you will see this small sign here. It's a reference to the place where you can see all the details in the book itself. Um, so that's a convenient way also if you want more information, you can go there, take a look at the book and see exactly all the details. Uh, if there's another thing you can do, a lot of the uh, small details, I would say, of the demonstrations, I will probably not do them today or during this week. But if you want to see them very slowly, you can go here on this website. <coughs> and here, it's, it's an English course also. And here, all the derivations are done much more slowly. This is the course I am giving in Toulouse. So you can pick up you know, the topic you want and go here, and you, you will be able to see again the same demonstration. So if you combine what I'm saying here, plus the book, plus this uh, website, you should be able to find your way. Even if you are lost today, you can come back later. On the same um, website, there's also an e-learning uh, capacity here. You can go there. There are other things on CFD. All of this is free. Actually, there are tools here that you can run, which are online tools. For example, to compute the adiabatic flame temperature of a mixture of gases, you can just come here and run the code online. Okay, it will give you right away the, the, the answer. There are all kinds of online tools here that you can have. Okay, so much for the um, presentation of what I'm doing. Let's talk about combustion. So combustion is a, is a strange science. It's a science which is basically everywhere uh, because uh, if you look at the numbers, you will see that on Earth today, all the energy basically is produced by combustion. The statistics are between 80 and 90 percent, which is amazing, which really means that our world is working because of combustion. You can talk to people working in nuclear energy, and in France, you know that nuclear energy is a big thing. You can talk to people working on wind energy, on sun energy. You hear a lot of these people on TV, but the real guys doing the job is combustion. We do the energy on this world. The other ones are talking. We do the job. So those are examples of uh, applications. When you talk about combustion, it can be uh, combustion in a, in a sophisticated rocket like that one. But it's also uh, these candles here. It's the wood fires, which is used all over the world to cook. Uh, and uh, so it covers a very wide range of applications. I've just listed here a few examples of combustion applications. Uh, just an example also that combustion is not limited to this world. If you're working in astrophysics and you look at the formation of stars and all this, you will also find that it's combustion, except that for them, the reactions are not chemical reactions, they are nuclear reactions. So, for example, they start by saying that everything which is less than one million Kelvin for them is cold. Okay? They don't look at it. Uh, of course, it's a different context compared to us. But when we work with them and we look at the codes they're using, they are exactly the same codes than the codes we use. Navier-Stokes equations plus chemical reactions or nuclear reactions. OK, so uh, we'll go through many of these examples during this course. I just want to give you one statistic, which is uh, important. Worldwide today, if you divide uh, the overall consumption, consumption of oil by the number of people, you find that we burn two liters of oil per person per day worldwide. So that gives you uh, an idea of how much we are uh, burning, which is large, if, especially if you consider that a lot of people are not burning anything. So that really proves that some countries are really consuming a lot of fuel. Now, there are other applications. You're all of you probably working with GPS. You know that GPS requires satellites, but satellites do not go there on their own. To have a satellite up there, you need this kind of animals and uh, rockets like this rocket here, would never work with something else than combustion. So just to, to remind you uh, of what combustion is, normally combustion is uh, what happens when you mix a fuel. We'll discuss later what we, what we call a fuel here. 
but you know most of them it's gas, so gasoline, kerosene. And you mix it with oxidizer. Oxidizers on Earth, in general, are air or pure oxygen. And of course, in both cases, it's really oxygen doing the job. Nitrogen doesn't burn. What you need is the O2 of this guy to combine with the fuel here. This will release products. Products are going to be CO2 and water in general, and heat. And of course, we are not interested at all in this reaction. We are interested in the heat. Okay, this is what we get out of the reaction here. Most of this course will be focused on gaseous combustion. Uh, there are all kinds of combustion. If you look at a solid propellant uh, uh, rocket, for example, you, you burn solids. In this case here, we'll be limited to the simplest, I would say, the simplest case, which is a gaseous fuel plus oxidizer giving products. And we may also talk about two-phase flow combustion, in which case the fuel is injected as droplets. This is what you do in a car. This is what you do in an aircraft. And the droplets have to atomize then they have to vaporize, then they have to mix with the air, and then you are back to the problem of a gaseous combustion situation. The, the first thing to say about, about combustion, and that's really the specificity of why we're here, is that the amount of heat which is released when you burn one kilogram of fuel is enormous. This is why we all do combustion. Uh, when this reaction takes place, typically for most hydrocarbons, so propane or methane, you release of the order of 50 megajoules per kilogram of fuel. This is why we do it. And there's just no other way on Earth to do the same thing. So to, to give you an idea of, uh, uh, of uh, the orders of magnitude, this is typically 30 to 50 times more than what you can get from a battery, which explains why, for example, in an aircraft, it's going to be very difficult to use batteries because you would need a very, very heavy aircraft, which would not take off, actually. That would be the main problem. Uh, among the other specificities of combustion, we must say that uh, combustion is very good to produce energy. It's also very good to store energy. Uh, because if you can store any kind of energy, for example, under the form of H2, then you can burn this H2 later. So there are many solutions today where you can use wind or sun to produce H2 during the day by electrolysis, for example. So you store your energy as a gas, and then you can burn this gas later when there is no wind or no sun. So just to come back to these numbers here, I've given here this simple number that you can uh, remember. If you have one kilogram of propane, it's as much energy as having 50 kilograms of the best batteries that you can have today. Uh, again, to come back to the, the picture of an aircraft, if you take a big aircraft like the 380, the 380 must carry the order of magnitude is of the order of 100 tons of kerosene. So if you would like to re replace, to make an electrical, fully electric uh, A380, you would need to replace 100 tons of fuel by 100 tons multiplied by 50 of batteries. So you can imagine. I mean, it's just never going to happen. Uh, also, the, the combustion can produce the largest levels of energy on Earth. Even a nuclear power plant, you can, you can have gas turbines, industrial gas turbines, which produce the same energy as a nuclear power plant. The only difference is that when a gas turbine explodes, it kills 10 people. When a nuclear power plant explodes, it's, it's a different game. And as I said, if you want to make big things fly, only combustion can do it. So that leads me to the first, uh, the first two equations I would like you to remember. And th the first equation is, uh, I've already mentioned it, it's energy on Earth today is combustion. Okay, it's just no one can escape that. And the very interesting thing, especially for us, for scientists working in that field, is that this is not what the public believes. The public believes that energy comes from the plug, actually. You just, you just pull it here, and there is energy. But this energy is obtained by combustion. And even when someone is telling you, I don't want a car working on fuel, I want an electric car. OK, how do you produce the electricity which runs the car? You produce it with combustion. So it's, it's still a combustion car. So at the end of the day, combustion is everywhere. But the important thing is that this is not going to change. 
even if you look at all the projections in the next 40, 50, 60 years, combustion will still be the first source. We hope that it will decrease. I will tell you why in a second. We hope that this 85% will go down. It would be reasonable to go to maybe 60 or maybe 50, but I don't think it's going to be doable. Why is it so? The main problem is that everyone is working today on the extensions of sun and wind uh, power sources. The problem is that if you increase the number of uh, these sources, it's still not enough to compensate for the fact that the global consumption of energy on Earth increases too. And uh, so to give you an idea, this is one scenario. There are many scenarios for energy because everyone can make projections, but all of them basically say the same thing. If you take the renewables that you have today, 2010, and project yourself in 2035, and you multiply almost them by two, which is difficult. I mean, you have to produce a lot of uh, wind mills and uh, sun power plants to do that. The problem is that if you do that, because the global energy demand increases even faster, we'll still have to burn more. So even, even so, the percentage of combustion will be less. We still need to burn more than what we burn today. Okay. And I'm not even talking about the nuclear power plants, but that's, of course, another discussion, which is not my topic today. So in all cases, what we need to do is that we need to optimize combustion because that's the first and the most efficient way of minimizing the effects of uh, combustion and of pollution. We need to optimize this thing. So that means that today we burn a lot. We will keep burning a lot. And our problem here, if you work in combustion, is that we must allow that without you know, increasing pollution too much, without killing people. It's not as bad as nuclear energy, but still you can kill a lot of people with a big... Uh, combustion system, which gets crazy. And we need to talk, of course, about global climate problem. Because now I've told you a lot of nice things about combustion, but you know that not everything is nice about combustion. Combustion is the first source of pollution worldwide today. And uh, so that's, that's a major problem. So we know that combustion creates things like CO2, and H2O, but then it creates all kinds of other things. CO, CO is extremely bad. You know that CO, if there is CO in this room and the concentration of CO is 0.4%, then you're dead. That's end of the day, okay? Uh, CO kills you. In CO2, you drown. With CO, CO fixes on your blood and then that you can, you can die in a few minutes. Uh, NO is also a pretty bad. Uh, gas and uh, bad for your health, bad for the, the ozone and uh, soot. We just talked about soot a few minutes ago. Soot, of course, is a major problem, major problem for your health, major problem for, for many, many applications worldwide. Now, I just want to say also that uh, these pollutions, uh, these pollutants are not the only uh, pollution created by combustion. Uh, if you look, for example, at noise, Noise is the first uh, pollutant that people feel. You know, if you, if you breathe uh, NO, it takes a while before you realize it. If you live very close to an airport, every day you will hear that, and that's also a pollution. Okay? It's, uh, you, have, you have to think about it, too. Um, so there are places where aircraft are very close to, uh, to, uh, to the place where people live, like this one here. So you can imagine, if you have to live with that every day, then noise generated by aircraft becomes a big issue. Now, noise can also be uh, not only a problem for your ears, it may be also a problem for uh, the structure. The, the first example of the problems generated by noise is uh, this kind of guys here. That's French, French engine again. Now, when you reach this kind of levels of uh, power, 
uh, what happens too is that the, the, it's not really noise that we should talk about, it's really vibrations. And the satellite on top of the rocket may have problem to survive. Actually, the first French rocket 40 years ago worked really well, but when the satellite arrived on orbit, it was destroyed, <laughs> shaking too much, so it was completely gone. So it's not noise, it's really vibrations now that you have to handle. And as you will see during this course, Combustion is not such a nice person in the sense that uh, it usually likes to oscillate a lot. And when it starts oscillating, everything starts vibrating, you go into problems. Now, um, another word about uh, climate. Climate, as you know, it's not only about pollution, it's also about the fact that when with combustion you are changing the climate. Uh, in Toulouse, uh, we've seen this kind of things. Uh, one of the questions, for example, is that uh, uh, with an aircraft or with all the aircraft that you have flying today, are you really changing the climate of the Earth? And uh, people have looked at this problem for a long time. You know that the world is split in two. People who believe that climate is changing and people who don't believe it. People who don't believe it are usually working for oil companies. Uh, <laughs> so there was a, a, a very nice paper in 2009 uh, by someone called Sawyer here at the symposium. The, the, you know, the, the International Symposium on Combustion takes place every two years. It's really the place to go if you want to, to follow what's going on in this community. And Sawyer was invited to give a talk on the link between combustion and climate change. So to make it short, Sawyer said there is just no way to say that we are not creating global change problems. Uh, you can go back, actually, to Fourier uh, 200 years ago. And Fourier already said, just because of radiation computation, that there was a link between the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and the temperature of the Earth. And actually, if you go back to Arrhenius, 70 years later, Arrhenius is a very famous person in combustion. You will see in a minute uh, that he worked a lot on, on reacting flows. And Arrhenius did a computation, and he said, you know, 150 years ago, he said, if you double the CO2 level on Earth, because of the radiation balance between the Earth and the, the space, then you would increase the temperature by 5 degrees. And that's, uh, it's, it's, it doesn't take a big, uh, a big amount of work to, to prove that. Now, today, if you go to IPCC, all these people working on combustion and climate change, especially on climate change, these people, there are probably 5,000 or 10,000 people doing that on Earth, but all of them are redoing the same computation. And you can argue about the details, but the truth is climate is changing before because we are injecting more CO2 into the atmosphere. Now, you can check that in many ways. Uh, this is, for example, today, and we're going backwards in time here, and this is the, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. We can measure that by going you know, to the poles and measuring how much CO2 we find in the ice. And we see that you know, this thing has been oscillating or changing not too much, and then suddenly it keeps going up very rapidly. And so what, what is this point here? It's when we started burning coal. Okay? And when you look at uh, the, this curve here and you make a zoom on it, you will see that it's always been increasing except for three, three periods in time. The first one was the First World War, the second one was the Second World War, and the third time this curve did not go up for a while was when the oil prices increased in 1970-something. So those three periods were periods where we burned less. Okay? The economy was going down, we were producing less CO2, and the CO2 went down. Now, of course, there are uh, oscillations, there are variations in all this business, but the most important thing to remember if you work on combustion is that as I said, we cannot avoid burning things, but when we do that, it's a bad idea. Okay? The best thing we could do is to stop combustion, but no one wants to do it. So we have to find a way to, to make it as efficient as possible. Now, I just want to mention here that uh, combustion is part of the global change problem. It's also part of the solution. I was just yesterday in, uh, in Delhi, actually. In Delhi, there are advertisements like that one on the walls of the airport. Uh, for example, you could imagine in the future that uh, the fuel you used in an aircraft could be a mixture of kerosene and of synthetic biofuel, in which case that would not be a problem for global change. 
Okay? You can produce the fuel differently. That would help. Uh, so the fuel could be better. Somehow the fuel could become green. You will still have combustion, but the fuel itself would be obtained by uh, removing CO2. The second thing is, uh, as I said before, you could use uh, combustion to store the energy. And uh, it's a very important thing to realize here is that when you produce wind, uh, energy with wind, or energy with sun, or energy with nuclear power plant, you cannot choose how much energy you do. A nuclear power plant takes months to be adjusted. The wind is what it is, and the sun is what it is. And now on the other side, as you know that energy cannot be stored, electricity, then you have to adjust continuously the consumption of energy to the production. None of these things can do that. Sun, wind, nuclear cannot do that. So how do you do it? Well, you can use combustion again. A gas turbine can operate very rapidly from zero to 100 percent of its power. And if it needs to be operated at 57 percent, no problem. You can adjust it to 57 percent. Not like the wind okay, or the sun. So in any strategy where you want to produce energy using sun or wind, you need also a combustion system. This is why today, when you go on many places where people produce energy with sun or wind, you will also find a gas turbine somewhere. And as I said, since we are not going to stop combustion, we need to improve combustion. So uh, another thing which is not as well known, uh, the fact that we release CO2 in the atmosphere is not the only way by which combustion changes climate. Um, for example, contrails are another source of climate change due to uh, aircraft. This is a view, uh, this is Surfax, it's a place where I'm working in Toulouse, and this is a view of contrails. You know that contrails are created by the exhaust of uh, engines in the, in, the, in the sky, and that this exhaust contains soot particles, and these soot particles are uh, nucleation sites for water. And so when you release a little amount of soot behind the aircraft, then the water comes and starts uh, condensing on these first soot particles, then it grows, and then it can create very large clouds. And these clouds actually keep growing. And there are many places worldwide where the cover of clouds is due to aircraft only. Because without aircraft, they, they would not be there. Now, these clouds also play a role similar to CO2. They change the balance of radiation between the Earth and space, and so they change climate. And uh, this issue is, of course, a very important one. You know that the traffic of aircraft is increasing all the time. So a lot of people uh, wonder if this is a good idea. Uh, it's very difficult to prove. You can do computations, or you can do s experiments. If you want to do an experiment of this problem, the only thing you can do today would be to stop completely aircraft traffic for a few days. Of course, no one can do that. It's been done only once. It's been done uh, uh, on uh, September 11th in, uh, in the United States for three days, as you remember. No one was allowed to fly over the USA. And uh, during these three days, uh, we have registered and measured temperature differences between night and day, which were larger than in the 50 years before. Of course, it's not a proof, but it's, it's a suggestion that if you have no aircraft, then you will have lower temperatures during the night, higher temperatures during the day, because the cover due to contrails would be less. So that's also a very important thing to do. One of the things we can do is that, and that's good science actually, you can find different routes, different altitudes, different speeds, different fuels, which will not create contrails. We know that contrails, when you look at the sky, you see contrails for certain aircraft, and for other aircraft, you don't see them which really tells you that there are methods by which we could suppress these things if we believe that they are important. Now, of course, combustion is doing also other things. You know, Even if you're not interested in combustion and you fly in this aircraft, suddenly you are interested. Okay? So uh, fires is, of course, uh, a major problem, even if you don't want to have them. Uh, so safety is a major issue also in combustion sciences. Uh, safety is, as uh, you've probably heard, there are very big fires at the moment in Canada. Uh, uh, this is the same aircraft I've shown you before. The, the French had very bad experience with uh, fires on, a, 
on this kind of uh, supersonic aircraft. And of course, all these examples here are, are cases where combustion is really the major problem. Now, I don't I want to spend too much time on the next topic, which is uh, army applications. But basically, if we would not have combustion, uh, wars would be very different. Uh, we can still kill each other, but it's much more efficient to kill people with combustion. Okay. Uh, I must say also that for engineers, it's much more fun to design this kind of aircraft uh, because they are flying so fast. So techni technically, it's a very interesting problem. During this course, I will not discuss this application too much. I might talk a little bit about detonation, which is important, but uh, not about army applications. I will really focus about uh, gas turbine examples. Uh, as I said, there is no other way to propel an aircraft. Even so, you can build one electric aircraft which would be flying like a few hours with one person on board. But if you want to go from uh, Delhi to Paris uh, with uh, 400 people on board, as I said before, it will be using uh, kerosene for a long, long time. Uh, these systems are very efficient. We've been working on them for a long, long time. Uh, the problem is that the regulations become tougher every day. It's like for car engines. It makes sense. We need better regulations because we need to produce less CO2, less pollution. And the engineers have made huge progress in the past. If you watch a movie of uh, 40 years ago, when you would see the aircraft taking off, you would see these soot traces behind them, huge soot, you know, clouds. Today, you don't see that. If you go to an, air an airport, you watch the aircraft taking off. It's very clean behind. Well, let's say you don't see soot anymore. The, the fact that you don't see soot doesn't mean there is no soot. Okay? It's actually, the doctors are saying it's even worse. The soot that you don't see is the soot which kills you. That's basically the idea. It's particles which have such a small diameter that they can not be seen, but they can penetrate your body and go to any place in your body. So it's a different, again, it's a different issue. There are statics, statistics in France released uh, a few months ago saying that soot, small particles of soot, could kill about 40,000 people every year just because of diesel engines. You know that the French have been doing a lot of diesel engines. And today, we, we start seeing that maybe it was not such a, such a good idea. In any case, we're coming back to the same idea. Optimizing combustion system is mandatory. Whatever you do, you need to make these combustion systems better. The problem is that, uh, well, this, if you look at an aircraft engine, it's been there for a long, long time. I mean, and the people before us, they were not stupid. They were doing a good job. So uh, if you want to, uh, to do better than what's been done before, you may have problems. One famous problem in France is a well-known one. Now in Europe, we had a very, very big European-funded project called LONOX. And of course, as the name indicates, the objective was to produce less NOX. And we, we built very good engines, which were doing that. But these engines were unstable they could not be operated. So they had good NOx uh, performances, but we could not operate them. Because when you try to optimize combustion, quite often you find out that it's not that simple. I think it was discussed when we started here half an hour ago. Flames operate on a narrow range of parameters. You cannot change things the way you want. You have to be very careful when you do that. So finding the best compromises is difficult. We, we're finding them. If you look at your car engine also, you compare your car engine to what it was 40 years ago, you will see that for the same weight, now you have two times more power and probably 10 times less pollution. So it is working, but it's, it requires a lot of expertise and a lot of work. This is why it's important to have young people go into that field. Now, I've, I haven't talked about it yet, but uh, uh, of course today, a lot of this optimization is done using CFD. Why do we do that? Well, uh, as we said also this morning, building an engine or building a combustion chamber is expensive. It takes time. It's dangerous. So it's much better to simulate these engines. So the idea in the community today is to say you build them after you compute them. You start by computing them. And when it works on the paper, or let's say when it works in the computer, then you build it, which is a good idea if your CFD codes are good. Because if your CFD codes are not good, you're losing your time. Okay? And I will go back to this question in the future. 
basically what I will try to convince you this week is that we need to go to these methods called LES, at least large GD simulation, because uh, existing codes at the moment don't do the job. Uh, I must say also if you talk to people in industry, they will tell you that uh, they are not interested at all in computing one combustion chamber. They want to find the best combustion chamber, which is a different problem. That really means that uh, you have to explore all the possible shapes, all the possible flow rates, all the possible fuels. So it is not about computing one chamber. It's about optimization. And optimization is quite difficult. I'm taking here an example coming from a, a gas turbine. So this is a, a French engine again. Uh, you have here the compressed air. You have the reaction zone. The colors correspond to temperature. Here you have the exhaust with the turbine here. And uh, in a system like this one, the big problem we have is to optimize the shape of this. If you look at the shape of a combustion chamber, you see that the, the volume of the chamber, the number of injectors, the place where you inject the fuel, the, what we call the dilution jets here, the cooling system for the walls, everything changes when you go from GE to Pratt to Rolls-Royce, whatever. Everyone has a different shape. When you look at an aircraft, all the aircraft look the same. Okay? You've got two wings and a fuselage, and it's, it's simple. When you look at, look at combustion chambers, all of them are different, which, which tells us something. Why are they different? Because we don't really know what is the best shape. Everyone is trying its own shape. And so the, the, the problem, what we would like to be able to do, is to optimize the shape in some kind of logical way, not only by intuition, but also, let's say, by some rigorous methods so that we know that this shape is the best one. And today, it's not the case. Uh, another uh, problem now, if you talk again to industry, is the quantification of the uncertainties. So the, the, the English name at the moment is UQ for uncertainty quantification. And uh, if you use a CFD code to design a chamber, what, uh, what industry is always telling you is that is they say, OK, you get one computation which says that the efficiency of this engine will be 92%. And then they say, are you sure? You know, is it 92 plus 2%, minus 2%, 20%? What is the uncertainty on your result? And today, it's a major problem because uh, it's very complicated to say if our computations are precise or not. We know they are not precise. But the question is, what is the level of errors that you expect? Is it 1% or is it 10 or maybe 100? And uh, quantifying the uncertainties for combustion is a major issue. Uh, combustion is very sensitive to a lot of things. Uh, when I was doing my PhD, for example, I was looking at combustion instabilities. So my burner was stable when, the, when there was no rain. But if it was raining outside, my engine was unstable. So, so we understand a little bit why. You know, when it's raining, you have more water into your air. So it's a little bit different. So the, the mixture will be different. The kinetics will be different. But normally, you don't want to care about that. Okay? You shouldn't care about rain when you do an experiment. But in combustion, you have to. And there are examples of uh, engine, of aircraft today, which have problems when it's raining. And it can be a problem, actually. So uh, now, if you talk about science now, uh, you know the problem about combustion is that it's what they call a multiscale phenomenon. Multiscale is like a, a buzzword. You know, everyone says multiscale because it looks good. The thing to remember is that it really means that you have very small scales and very large scales. Very small scales, this is an example of combustion in a rocket engine. This is uh, 0.5 millimeter here. And the place where combustion takes place, the flame thickness is here. And it's of the order of a few microns, micrometers. But it's very small. This is a 100 bars, high pressure system. In a system like this, the flame is located in a very small zone. But at the same time, you need to compute the whole engine. So the, the point is that uh, if you want to compute the whole engine, which is like two meters long, and at the same time, you need to compute this kind of things here, you're going to need billions of billions of points. So in that sense, it's multiscale, 
because you need to resolve a very large range of scales. Uh, it's also multi-scales because even when you go outside of the engine, for example, here behind this aircraft, you will have a contrail, and, and we also compute contrails. The contrail can be two kilometers long, and in the engine, as I said, it's one or two micrometers. So, of course, it's multi-scale. So that's going to be complicated. So when you talk about CFD of combustion, you know right away that uh, it will be a difficult task. So during this course, we'll talk about engines uh, because they are today probably uh, the, f the field where uh, we get the most money. That's important. Uh, so we are able to push the research to the limits. Uh, I just want to say that what we do for these engines also applies to other things, uh, furnaces, uh, all kinds of power systems. It's just that for these engines, this is the place where we get the most, uh, uh, the highest number of experiments and uh, the, the most people working, because I guess that's where you get the money for the moment. So the technologies there are, of course, complicated technologies. This is the, the piston engines in the car you're driving every day. Even in a system like this, uh, combustion is extremely complicated. This is a four-stroke, uh, four-cylinder engine. And uh, in a system like this, you have to fight with everything. You have uh, very complex aerodynamics. You have uh, injection. You have combustion. Everything is unsteady. It's turbulent. And we'll talk about that uh, later this week. Uh, one example of versatility, I've told you that engines can be used over a very wide range of parameters. You can use piston engines for this kind of application. So this is the Cox engine. It's one of the smallest engines in the world. That's the one you use to propel a miniature aircraft. And uh, so this is 0.1 cc. Okay, So that, that's small. Most engines are more like uh, 1,000. And uh, it pro it's producing one third of a horsepower. And on the other uh, side of the range, you get this type of engines. That's for a uh, ship. And this one produces uh, of the order of 100,000 horsepower. And in, the in between, you can cover any range you want with an engine with pistons. And then I would just like here to raise the first question, which will be actually very important during this week. Uh, it's, I would say, an engineer naive question. Uh, in a system like this, how come that we can burn our fuel in a very small engine and in a very large engine? Or to put the question in a different framework, if you take an engine in a motorcycle, you know the motorcycle can hide, idle at uh, like 800 RPMs, probably. And also, if you go to full power, it will go to 16,000 RPM, which is 20 times faster. How is it possible? that combustion can work at speed 1 and then at speed 20. Uh, well, nothing changes. You burn the same fuel, it's the same shape, it's still air plus kerosene. So the flame speed probably is not very different. So how is it possible that now at 16,000 RPM, you have 20 times less time to burn and still it's working? Well, this is turbulent combustion. Turbulent combustion has this capacity which is actually the reason why we're able to operate all these engines. Turbulent combustion can increase the speed of combustion. We discussed that many times this week. When the flow is turbulent, then combustion increases. It increases sufficiently so that you can work with low levels of turbulence at 800 RPM. So turbulence in an engine which is turning slowly is low. And turbulence in an engine which is turning fast is high and promotes combustion speeds. And it helps us to operate these engines. Without turbulence, we would not be able to operate these engines. So that's good. The problem is that you will see in a minute that turbulence is also very, very complicated. And uh, so for engineers and researchers, it makes our life complicated now because we know we need turbulence, but we know it's going to be difficult to explain. Now, what I've said for piston engines also apply to gas turbines. You can have gas turbines as big as this one here or as big as that one. Okay? And you cover a range of power from 50 watts to uh, 300 megawatts. Uh, and you can cover any range in between. So just to give you an idea, uh, 
that's a view of, of this turbine here, what we call a micro. It's not even a micro. It can, you, can, you can hold it in your hands. Uh, that's a view of this uh, engine. It's a very small gas turbine. So why would we do that? First question is, why are we interested? Every time you see money flowing into an application like this, you can be sure it's for the army. Why is it for the army? You know that the, the problem today, if you want to fight a war, is that you need to have soldiers uh, on the ground fighting for three days, typically. So three days uh, for a human person is not difficult to gain without sleep. You just inject a lot of things in their blood. Maybe they die afterwards, but they can work for three days. What is not going to work is their weapon system, because they won't have batteries to operate for three days. They need a lot of energy for GPS, for weapons, for communication. If you give them batteries, they would have to carry like, you know, a car battery on their back. It doesn't work. And the reason for that, again, is the same. This number is not right. It's not 15. It's 50. If you carry 100 grams of methane, you can carry it's the same as 50 times more energy in the battery. So to s save the weight that you have on your back, the idea would be instead of carrying all these batteries, you could carry only methane. And then with this methane, you would burn it with air that you have everywhere, and you can produce energy. So this gas turbine would be on the, on the back of the soldier, and it would be very small, and it would replace all the batteries. Okay? There's another application behind this one. I mean, all of you know that. You all have a cell phone. You know that the cell phones have a problem, is that you need to do something every evening. Okay? These guys here don't last more than a day. I mean, that's uh, maybe two days. But if you could use this thing here with methane, you would just go you know, and fill that with methane every two weeks. And that would be sufficient. So that would be a big, a big jump. And so that's what we call a micro turbine. The problem here uh, is that these things don't work. They don't work because the heat losses are so large. The system gets too small. All the heat that you produce is lost by, uh, 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 let's say, losses through the structure. But the idea is interesting. Uh, now, if you go to the other uh, side of these engines, of course, you get the big gas turbines, like uh, the gas turbines you put on an aircraft, like this one here, which are fascinating animals. When you look at the inside of a jet engine, you recognize the complexity of the problem. You have the fan first, then the low pressure and the high pressure compressor, then you go into the combustion chamber, then you go into the low pressure, high pressure, low pressure turbine, then you go into the exhaust. What we are, we are working on is really this zone here. Okay? This is the, the combustion chamber here between the compressor and the turbine. Now, for those of you who have forgotten about the thermodynamic courses, you know, why do we have a compressor? Well, you have a compressor here because we know that efficiency, thermodynamic efficiency goes up with pressure. If you would do that combustion at low pressure, you would lose a lot of uh, efficiency. So the main thing to do in an engine is efficiency, is compression. And the, the race towards more efficient engines today is a race which is one here. This is where you increase the pressure. Then when you go into the combustion chamber, what you need to do is to burn all the fuel. And this, you will see, we, we can do. Now again, these engines can be pretty big. Uh, this is a view of, uh, of a Rolls Royce engine. Uh, these things are uh, pretty amazing in terms of size and power. You can see here one of these engines. First, you recognize the, the complexity of the animal. Remember that uh, for us combustion people, the, the only important thing here is really the combustion chamber, which is really small. You won't, see, you won't even see it. It's hidden here. But uh, it would not operate without compression, compression stages and uh, turbines. This is the same engine now coming out of the, of, the, of the factory. You can see here one person, and you can see the size of this engine. Gives you an idea of the, the kind of things you can do with, with combustion. Now, just a few words about terminology. Since we're going to talk a lot about uh, gas turbines, you see the chamber is here, the combustion chamber is here. You see how small it is compared to the compressor or to the turbine. So if you zoom on this chamber, um, the axis of the turbine is here. And this thing is all around the axis. 
uh, we'll have here fuel injection. Fuel injection in gas turbines can be gas or it can be liquid. If it's on an aircraft or on an helicopter, it will be liquid, it will be kerosene. But if you work for Alstom or for Siemens, they will inject also methane, natural gas, and sometimes they start mixing them. They mix natural gas and oil and all this, and that gets more complicated. Um, we'll have here what we call the primary zone, where you have a first combustion, and then you have cooling air, dilution air, and it goes to the turbine. Um, by the way, combustion today is not only uh, a combustion problem only, it's really a heat transfer problem. Why do we do here, for example, this kind of setup where we burn things and then we dilute it again with air? It's really a problem of structure. The wall here, everywhere, all the metal that you use to uh, confine the chamber, confine combustion, this is metal usually, and these metals will die if the temperature is more than, depends, but let's say 1200, 1500 K, that's, that's the end for this material. Well, the temperature, when you burn an hydrocarbon with air, is more than that. It's more than 2000. So in other words, it's a very complicated problem. We need to have here 2000 Kelvin, but the walls cannot sustain 2000 Kelvin. So how do you do that? Well, you need to cool everything. So you, you have combustion, but then right away you inject air to cool these gases so that they can go to the turbine. And uh, the first stages here of the turbine here are really controlling also the efficiency because if they burn, that's the end of the engine. And so if you cannot go to a high temperature here, you cannot go to a high pressure here, you cannot go to a high efficiency. So many things we're going to be discussing this week are not related to combustion only. They are also related to combustion near walls. So that's going to be flame wall interaction. It's going to be a main topic. So we're going to need to discuss cooling also. And that's very important if you want to design an engine. Uh, just one word about, uh, about these engines again. Uh, that's, uh, that's a view of the fan, just to give you an idea of uh, uh, how difficult it is to build those things also. And I will come back to that later this week, but uh, the important thing about all these systems is that they don't like vibrations. For obvious reasons, uh, all these systems are built so that they operate normally without vibrations. If you start having vibrations, then you go into trouble, and you will see that combustion is a very good source of uh, vibration uh, generation. Now, if you look at uh, this is a, a combustion chamber for a uh, uh, helicopter, and you see that uh, there are what we call sectors here. Those are injectors. So the chamber is annular, and we have a certain number of injectors or of sectors. We can have between you know, 8, 9 to maybe 20, 24. If you look at a Siemens engine, you can have 24 injectors like this. In each system here, you will inject fuel, and air will go around it, and then uh, mix, and the combustion chamber is here, and combustion takes place within this chamber. Now, uh, if you look at one sector only, that's an helicopter chamber, and as often in industry, people make things complicated very fast. So in an helicopter, the flow goes like this. You enter this way, then you turn, you enter into the chamber that way, then you turn again and you go to the turbine. Okay? You do that to make the, the turbine more compact to minimize the weight. In an helicopter, weight is everything. Okay? If you have a very good engine which is heavy, it's not going to fly. Okay? The weight is very difficult to control. So in a system like this, air is coming here, and here you get what we call the injector. This animal is plugged here, and uh, here you inject air and kerosene. Now, this element here is a very important one. This is where we mix the air with the droplets. This thing here is really the key ingredient of the chamber. Uh, Combustion is like cooking, you know, if you want to make a cake and you don't mix the butter with the sugar, it's not going to work, okay? Same for combustion, if you want a flame, you need to mix the fuel and the air. And the fuel here is a liquid fuel, so you need to break it into droplets, this is what this thing is doing here, and then you need to mix it with air, and then you can maybe burn it. And the mixing now, 
the mixing of two gases or the mixing of liquid droplets with gases becomes another critical aspect of combustion. If you don't do this mixing right, then combustion will not take place. And it's so, impo so true that uh, uh, the design of these uh, swirlers, we call them swirlers, has become a very, very uh, essential game in the gas turbine community. Because we know that everything we do here controls the flames afterwards. That's another combustion chamber. This one is from SNECMA. Uh, you have here the combustion chamber. And here you can see the injectors, OK? And the, the injectors are located here. And that's a CFD computation where you see the combustion into, inside the chamber. If you take one of these things here, one of these injectors, normally I carry one with me, but that was not allowed. Uh, I think I would have problems at the uh, airport here. That's, uh, that's, that's fingers, so it's not big. It's like this, you know? And if you put that on the, on the lab and you operate it, so you start it, you will see it looks like this. So uh, that's the flame. So the flame will be big like this. And uh, it's a small flame because this is a swirling system. If there would be no swirl, the flame would be very big. But because it's swirled, it makes a very compact flame. I will explain that later. And swirl is a very convenient way to have small flames. You need to swirl those flames all the time. Now, if you come back to this, uh, to this movie, uh, as I said before, here you have the reaction zone, here you inject cooling air, and here you go to the turbine stages. Uh, if you're an engineer, the things which are required from you uh, when you build a chamber like that are listed here. The first thing, of course, is that if you have a combustion taking place here, the turbine, which is here, should not burn. That's, that's mandatory. Okay. Uh, the efficiency should be high. What do we call the efficiency? If I inject one kilogram of fuel, I must burn almost everything, okay? I, because it's, it's, it's a loss. I must burn all the fuel. And usually, we do it. And then, in addition, the pollution should be low. We should not produce too much NOx and too much CO. And uh, in practice, again, as I said a few minutes ago, to do that, you have your choice. You do what you want. You want more holes. You want smaller holes. You want a different shape. You want more injectors, it's up to you. And you see that it's a very open problem because there are so many parameters that you can change. And uh, so it becomes now only, not only combustion, it becomes a, a mathematical problem. How do we optimize a system like this? How do we know that we get the holes at the right place? Uh, to give you an idea, so the way it's done today, it's done by trying. So you build the chamber, you operate it, if it doesn't work, you modify it. Uh, the typical number of iterations before you made it can be 50. You have to build 40, 50 chambers before you find one which is working reasonably for everything. And that's uh, it's actually a problem. We are working on different projects, for example, where after four or five years, everything is working well. We get all the performances, except there is too much soot. The soot level is too high. So then you are, ah, OK, how do I do that? Well, I need to fix the suit level. So you start fixing the suit level, but then the NOx doesn't work anymore. And then you fix the NOx, and then you cannot ignite the chamber. And then you know, it's, a, it's today, I would say that people who are designing chambers, it's more like an art than a science, OK? There's no systematic way to do it. You have to do it until it works. And that's, it's, it's unpleasant. So that really means that. When we're going to be talking about these things, you cannot hope to do combustion only. You have to do combustion and heat transfer to understand what's going on. Now, I've said that uh, you have to fix your engine, but remember that the engine is not working for one condition of power. It has to be able to go from idle to full power. Uh, the inlet temperature can be anything. You know, it has to work when it's hot in India today. It has to work also in Siberia with minus 40 or 50, same engine, same fuel. So you have to find compromises. And it has to work at low pressure altitude or at high pressure on the ground. And it has to be able to work even if there is water in the air. So all this makes the compromises difficult. Now, there's another condition, which we will discuss also this week. If you have an engine, you must be able to ignite it. That looks uh, like a simple statement. It's, it's not, actually. 
It's easy to ignite an engine if you put a very big igniter in it. Okay? You bring a huge flame, you're going to ignite your combustor. But in a real engine, you don't have huge flame. You, you have small sparks. And with this spark, you must be able to ignite your engine. And that may be difficult. And you must be able not only to ignite it, but to reignite it. What does it mean? Reignition for an aircraft is you lose the engines because you go, for example, in the wake of a, of a volcano when you have ashes in the air and no oxygen. And that happened in the past. Uh, there are many examples where people lost, for example, on a 747, they lost the four engines, quenched, died, and then you have to reignite them. So reignition is a critical point there because if you don't reignite the engine before uh, a few minutes, then uh, you are in trouble. Uh, quenching, the engine, the engine must not quench. Let me tell you what we call quenching here. Quenching in a burner is what happens when the flame stops. The flame can suddenly stop burning. If the flame stops burning, the engine stops, then the plane falls, and then if you don't reignite it, you are in trouble. Quenching can occur for many flames, uh, but obviously for uh, uh, aircraft and helicopters, it's, it's much more of a problem. Um, what causes quenching? Well, it's complicated. Again, um, it's normally due to something which is changing in your flow. For example, uh, if you're in a helicopter and the pilot wants to slow down the engine, it's going to push the manet you know, to minimum values. So the flow rate of kerosene will go down. But the flow rate of air, which is controlled by the rotation of the turbine, will not go down as fast. So maybe at the, some point you will have a, mix, a mixture which is not right, and then the engine can stop, which is, of course, very dangerous. But there are other reasons. Uh, you can have, uh, as I said, less oxy oxygen into the air because you are crossing a, a cloud. Or you can have rain or ice. Actually, uh, rain is something which must be included uh, into the design when you optimize an engine. That's, again, a uh, world's worst case. And you will see here they are injecting water. So they put this uh, water generation system, which is just sprays, and they inject this spray into the engine. And the engine must be able to live with 140 tons per hour of water coming in. Because as you know, I mean, when you take an aircraft, it takes off even if it's raining. So you can imagine for, for the engineers, you have to worry about these droplets everywhere. Now, Ignition is another mechanism that we need to discuss. Um, there are different types of uh, ignition problems. In an aircraft, you need to start the engine on the ground. You do that only once, normally. And then if the engine stops, you need to be able to reignite. For helicopters, the business is a little bit different because reignition is not an issue in an helicopter. In an helicopter, if the engine stops, you're dead. That's it. Oh, no. But there are, there's another thing which is important, is that you must be able to stop somewhere at a high altitude and wait a few hours and then restart the engine. If you have missions on, uh, uh, on mountains, that happens quite often. And that's difficult, because if you stop at 5,000 meters with an helicopter engine, the air will be cold, the batteries will be almost dead because the temperature is low, and uh, your igniters will have problems. So it's actually very difficult to reignite an helicopter engine above 4,000, 5,000 meters. It's quite difficult. So again, when you optimize your engine, you cannot optimize it, it only to reduce NOx and CO and soot. If you cannot ignite it, it's not useful. So you see that the compromise is, is very difficult. Now, um, before I think we'll just take a short break. But before that, I just want to talk about turbulent combustion there. Everything I have described takes place in the turbulent flow. So all the combustion processes in real engines always take place in a turbulent combustion regime. So turbulent combustion, we discussed that a lot uh, this week, is much more difficult than looking at laminar flames, but we have to handle that all the time. So uh, that means also that uh, we need to talk about the interaction now between turbulence and chemistry. Turbulent combustion means you have a turbulent flow with chemical kinetics happening in the flow at the same time. And the coupling between these two will be a problem. This is why we spend so much time today trying to have good models for turbulent combustion, because we know that in all these processes, everything is controlled by turbulent combustion. OK, so 
to com conclude on this part here, uh, today, when you work on a commercial chamber, and everything I've said is also true if you work at, on other systems like power plants or furnaces, it's, everyone has the same problem. You need to optimize these systems, and that has become a very uh, complicated task because you optimize not only the full power regimes, but you have to optimize the ignition, the quenching, the pollutions, everything at the same time. After, after the break, uh, I will start talking about something else now. This optimization that we do all the time, we, we keep tuning our engines. We change the shape, we change the flow weights, we change the ignition systems. And when we do that, quite often, we end up with what we call combustion instabilities. Combustion instabilities are a major problem, and it basically means that the flame, instead of being you know, steady, it starts oscillating. So I will discuss that after the break, and I think I suggest we just take a five minute break now. Okay, thank you. If you have questions, you can just come and see me. So I was going to, to, to start discussing commercial instabilities. Uh, there will be uh, many courses on commercial instabilities later, but I wanted just to introduce the, the topic to you by a classic example, which is the example of the backward-facing step. So this movie here corresponds to the simplest turbulent flame you can do. You have a flow coming here. You have a, a step here where you recirculate some gases to stabilize the flame, and its flow, this flow is turbulent. And that's a good example of turbulent combustion cases. And uh, as you can uh, see, if this works, yeah, let me do that slowly. OK, this is what we call turbulent combustion usually. So the flow is turbulent, so the flame is turbulent. And everything you see here are, are structures, unsteady structures due to turbulence. Uh, and uh, here, temperature is low, about 300 K. And here it's about 2,000 K. And that's what we call stable combustion. Now, if you try to optimize this flame, in, for us, optimizing usually means you change something. In that case, it's sufficient to change the equivalence ratio to go into this kind of flames. You see here that uh, this flame is almost the same as before, but it has a small problem. Everything here is taken at 2,000 images per second, so it goes much faster than what you see here. You see that the flame does not stay here. The flame does something we call flashback. It's an intermittent flashback. The flame flashes back. Which they try to change the, the shape, but you see that the result is the same. This flame is flashing back. And uh, when the flame does that, uh, many unpleasant things can happen. The first thing which happens is that you have a lot of noise. You have a lot of vibration. And so the system can have problems. Because of this vibration, for example, the electronic components might just break because they're shaking too much. But also, the flame, when it's flashing back here, it's coming to a place which was not designed to have a flame. The, place, the places which are here, upstream of the, this zone here, are designed to have mixing, not to have a flame. And if a flame starts here, you're in bad shape because you're going to melt the injectors, you're going to kill all the walls. It's going to be the end of the engine. Now, we know when this film was taken uh, uh, 40 years ago, we did not really know the mechanisms. Today, the mechanisms are rather clear. We know that the mechanism is the following. Um, if you have an unsteady flow rate at the inlet here, it will create these large vortices that you see here. These large vortices, they will burn suddenly. When they burn, they will have an unsteady heat release. And the unsteady heat release will produce an acoustic wave. You know that an unsteady flame makes noise. It's easy to, to recognize. You know, the noise associated to combustion is well known. And when you have an acoustic wave here, if this acoustic wave somehow creates a new change in the unsteady flow, then the system can get crazy, and you get into instabilities. Now, these uh, instabilities, they are a major problem for us because uh, when you have one, you are in deep, deep trouble. Uh, 
So there are many examples. I will describe some of them. The most famous one is the engine of the Apollo program. Uh, but the, the thing you have to remember is that if suddenly, during the optimization of a chamber, you encounter a combustion instability, you have to stop everything and find a way, you know, because the engine cannot be operated. There was an example on an on a helicopter engine five years ago. Uh, there was a combustion instability. When the combustion instability was observed, it was too late in the project. The lifetime of the engine was 20 hours, okay, instead of 2,000. So the customer, actually, I think it was India, uh, was not happy about it. And uh, so we had to fix the problem in two months, you know. And again, it's, it's a desperate situation because you discover this problem at the last moment. Needless to say that for the moment, it's very difficult to predict these things. When you do CFD, it's also a topic I will come back later to. Uh, when you do CFD, these kind of things are not included in most commercial softwares. You need very specific softwares to, to predict these things. Okay. Uh, just a word for some of you in the room may be might be experts in uh, turbulence. I want to just to to clarify things. For turbulence people, when, what they call unstable is when they see vortices. It's not like this for the combustion community. When we see vortices and these vortices remain in the chamber, we still call it stable. What we call unstable is really when the flame starts going to places where it should not go. That's what we call combustion instability. It's a little bit different from what the turbulence community ca calls unstable. For them, unstable is when you create vortices. Now, an example on a real engine, this is a gas turbine. You see the flame here has been flashing back, coming back here, and of course, when the flame hits these points, everything melts, okay, it dies. Same thing for the uh, rocket engine. Uh, you can guess that this was not designed by the engineers, okay? You can see the shape, you know, what's left after the interaction of the flame with the flame holders. That was not the case. So I'd like just to comment on the F F1 engine because that's a very uh, good example. You know that uh, in the 60s, Kennedy said, we want to go to the moon and we want to go to the moon before the Russians. It was really a military project, actually. And uh, so the, the Americans had an engine. They had an engine which was working. And they, s they computed, OK, I have this size. Now I want to do this size. How many engines do I need? They said, if we use five engines of that type, and we multiply the size of each engine by a factor of 10 or something, then you have the right power. So that's what they did. They took this F1 engine here, they took one, they scaled it up, and they operated it. So they started it, it exploded right away. So they said, oh, that's strange. So they rebuilt it, started it, exploded right away. So they started putting sensors, and they saw that what, what was happening was a combustion instability. So they said, we're going to fix it by trying to find a solution. And the solution was that uh, in two years, because remember, that was, that was, it was a military program, okay? They had two years to make this engine run. In two years, they, they tested more than 1,000 engines. So you can compute how many engines you have to test every day. They had to build a plant for liquid oxygen on the same site because they were burning so much oxygen every day. And uh, what they had to try to do they had to modify the engine by adding baffles, as you can see here. Those are small walls that you insert into the system. They had to change the injectors. Each hole here is an injector. So they changed the way they inject the fuel. And they did it almost by only trial and errors. And it took them two years to do that. And they say probably $2, billions of $2 billion to do that. Today, we would not be able to do that. So they encountered a commercial instability. And to solve it, the only solution was to try. Okay. To give you an idea, in this engine, the mean pressure is maybe of the order of 60 to 70 bars. And the oscillations of pressure were plus or minus 40 bars. So the pressure was going you know, from 30 to 100 and oscillating like this. And you can imagine that the engine would not survive to, that, uh, uh, to this treatment for a long time. OK. so. Coming back to my point here is that uh, you want to be able to compute these things. You don't want to have to do all these test cases because it's just too expensive. And not only expensive, it's also dangerous. So we need to have CFD, but the problem is that CFD today is not really able to do that. The problem is that 
Turbulent combustion in general is very complicated because you need to handle turbulence, kinetics, but also radiation, heat transfer to the wall, sometimes the, stru the structures which are vibrating, so that's a major problem. So uh, the situation today is that uh, CFD is not able to do everything and that uh, I wouldn't fly in an aircraft if it was only designed by CFD, okay? You need experiments. The point is that we only try to limit experiments. We try typically, that's what we do for aircraft, it would be happy to use maybe 10 or 20 percent test compared to what we have today. It would be a big saving, uh, but we still need them. Now, turbulence. Turbulence is really our first problem. What is the problem here? You know that if you measure temperature, this is a ramjet, uh, you measure temperature somewhere, and you plot it versus time, the curve will look like this. You know, it's a turbulent signal, so it has all kinds of frequencies there, and it's changing all the time. And uh, if you would do an experiment, or even if you would be able to do a perfect simulation, you would be able to capture all these things. But you imagine that you have a 3D flow changing over time, uh, the cost will be crazy. So for a long time, I mean even before my generation, uh, people said we are not going to try to capture all these details, we are going to try to compute only the mean. So you are saying I don't want to know all the details of the temperature fluctuations in this system, I only want to know the mean temperature. And this is what you will find in most, actually in all commercial codes today. If you buy Fluent or CFX or Star CD, Star CCM, all of them compute the mean temperature. The, what we do and, uh, is that we believe that this is not enough and we try to work with large eddy simulation where we try to capture at least the large scale variations here of the signal. Uh, this is in time. In space, it really means that you need to try to capture the large vortices here and you, try you can forget about the smallest one. Okay, the smallest ones are not important. You try to capture the big ones. That's, that's the main objective of large eddy simulation. It still requires that you solve for time-dependent signals. So it's going to be very expensive compared to once. But for many flows, it's really uh, the key problem. Now, whatever you do, whether you do once or LES, you're going to have to model a part of the spectrum of the scales. If you do once, you need to model all these small scales somehow. If you do LES, you need to model the only the smallest one, but you still need models. So you need to worry about turbulence. Everyone seems to know what turbulence is. If you go even on TV, they tell you, oh, it was a turbulent flow. OK, but do we really know what turbulence is? Um, I'm just going to show this movie, which is a movie without combustion. It's pure, simplest, the simplest turbulence you can have. It's turbulence in a box, isotropic, homogeneous. So it's really the simplest example you can have of turbulence. And uh, this is done by the group at Johns Hopkins here. And those guys, what you're going to see on the movie is in this box, we're going to look at vorticity. Uh, vorticity really tells us where things are turning. We don't plot vorticity, we plot something else called the Q criterion. Uh, the Q criterion really tells you where the vortices are. So it's a good way to track vorticity. It's also a good way to show how the turbulent flow is organized. And so when you do that in a flow like this, this is what you find. This is what turbulence is, okay? This everything, every little piece here is a little vortex. And you see how all these vortices are organized. You can see actually that uh, these small vortices are organized into larger scale vortices. This is what we call the Kolmogorov cascade. And you can see all these things, you know, happening at the same time. And you can recognize also that this is what we are looking at, okay? It's not going to be easy right? uh, because these signals are obviously uh, time dependent. They depend on also on space. They change all the time. And if we want to model them, it's going to be difficult. Because what we have to do is that we need to send the flame now into this turbulent flow. So it's not going to be easy. And um, if you talk to people you know, in uh, sell selling commercial codes, they will tell you, oh, it's working. No, it's not working. It's not working. And uh, every time you do a real test case where you try to change things in a blind test, 
you will see that these commercial codes don't, don't get the answer. They have no idea what's going on. Okay? Because the system is very complicated. So it's going to be fully unsteady, 3D, and to compute that, it's going to be very difficult. So the, the idea, the first idea to say it is complicated, so let's give up on computing everything. We're just going to compute the average values. So uh, that's nice, but uh, the, the, mean, the big question here, what does the mean mean? Okay? Uh, the mean quantity of something is not always uh, meaningful. Uh, just let me give you uh, an example here. Uh, suppose, I always give this example to my students when they go for a postdoc, you know, tell them, when well, you go somewhere for a postdoc and they give you the average temperature of the year at the place where you will live, you, will, you should ask uh, additional questions. Because, for example, if they tell you, you're going to work in a lab where the, in a country where the average temperature is 20 degrees, it could be that the temperature is going from uh, you know, 22 in summer to 18 in winter, but this signal has the same mean. Okay? It could be plus 50 during the summer and minus 20 in the winter. Those two signals have the same mean temperature. So if you know the mean temperature at one point, you don't know that much about this point. So even if you were able to compute the mean with precision, the mean would not be sufficient. The best example, also in the gas turbine now, is if you are sitting at the outlet of the gas turbine, you are a blade you know, of the turbine, and you have the gas turbine, in the, you have the engine in front of you, so the chamber, and the burn gases go towards you. You know that you cannot survive the temperature is more than this. Okay? If the temperature is more than that, you're dead. But the guy who is doing the commercial chamber tells you, oh, don't worry, the mean temperature is less than that. Say, okay, but you know, here, it's not going to work, OK? So if you know the mean temperature and the signal looks like this, you're still in trouble here because you're not going to survive. So if you're an engineer working uh, for the turbine department, what you do is that the engineer here of the combustion chamber department tells you this is the mean temperature. And so you add a safety margin of 200K just to be sure that uh, you are really far away from that. And this is the way it's done today. People know that the mean is not sufficient, so they take a large safety margin. But the problem is that this safety margin means you need more cooling, it's going to be heavier, it's going to be more expensive. So if your competitors take more risks than what you do, then they're going to be better than you. And so as time goes by, people want not only to know the mean, they want to know the extreme values so that they can you know, exactly adjust the, the, the cooling systems. And so uh, it really means that uh, in the future for your generation, clearly computing means is not going to be sufficient. You're going to have to compute also the fluctuations. So it's, it's been done. I mean, it's, it's still used today. And I think if you look at combustion and flame, for example, 10 years ago, we had a lot of papers where people were trying to develop once models. But today, I don't receive any maybe once, one, once a year paper on once. All the papers are on large GD simulation because uh, even so, large GD simulation has not diffused yet to industry. Uh, it's, not, it's clearly the future, and once is, is not going to be uh, there in 10 or 20 years. So let's give examples. Uh, when else average simulations, so these methods where you try to compute only the mean, they have been here for a long time. And they are in commercial codes and in industry for more than 20 years. So for example, if you compute a flow like this one, you have a step here. Here you inject fuel. Here you inject air. This is what the code like Fluent will give you. It will give you a mean temperature field. Uh, long time ago, the combustion community said, we don't want to do this thing too much. I mean, we know it's not a real flame. So what we want to do is direct numerical simulation. So DNS is really on the other side of the spectrum. You do DNS, you say, I don't want any modeling. I want to resolve all the scales, and I want to do it very precisely. So it's great. So you have, you have no model. It's fully unsteady. The small problem is that you can compute only a box which is like this. You know? So it has to be a cubic box. 
you can see here, for example, a, a methane flame. You can see the flame form. It's great, but you cannot use it for an engine. So DNS is really limited to very, very small domains. It's a great tool, but it's not sufficient. And so it really means that uh, you can use RANS for the full engine. You can use DNS of a very small box. That's why you need LES. Okay. LES is a mixture of the two. You want a method which resolves unsteady structures, but you want to be able to do it on a real engine. So why is the mean not enough? Well, uh, I just want to give you two examples here. Uh, the first one is this uh, a laboratory diffusion flame. The second one is a piston engine. Uh, this is an example where you inject propane here and air. So this is an experimental work. Uh, the system has uh, quartz windows. You can look at the combustion from the side. You can do all kinds of diagnostics. And if you look at the mean flow, as I've shown before, this is what you obtain. So this is the mean temperature. So this is cold, this is hot, and this is what fluent will give you. If you do a large dissimulation of the same flow, this is what you observe. And you see that here, this is an isosurface of temperature. You see a very different picture now. You see it's, it's unsteady. It's moving all the time. There is no, the shapes that you've seen before uh, are not in the unsteady flow. If you average this unsteady flow, you will find out you know, the same thing that once found. But uh, for physics, you see obviously that it's a very different flow. So again, the mean does not tell you much. In an LES of a piston engine, we have a, even a more interesting example. The first thing to say for piston engines is that you don't average over time. Okay? In a piston engine, you have to average over cycles, which makes things uh, a little bit more complicated. Okay? Uh, averaging over time, everyone understands how you average over time. Okay? You, you just take time signal and you average it. Over cycles, it really means that uh, in an engine, you will have, uh, here you have the crank angle. And uh, if you look at pressure, for example, in an engine, you have a maximum of pressure after combustion. And then uh, you finish the cycle and you do another one. So when you average, when you think you average in a Reynolds average methods for engines, what you really do, you do one cycle like this which looks like this, and you say, at this crank angle, I measure pressure. Then I do another cycle, and the other cycle might go here, and I take this value. Then I do another cycle, and I do this value. And I average all these values, and this is what I will call the mean pressure. So these cycles are all disconnected. Okay? They are following cycles. And the mean here uh, is more difficult to understand and to, and to, to see. To give you an example here, suppose this is, a f this is, of course, just an example. Suppose you have an engine where you have 500 cycles turning in this direction, and then 500 cycles turning exactly at the same speed but the opposite direction. The mean will be zero, of course. So what does it mean? I mean, it's just uh, we know it's moving, but the mean, the mean would be zero. And that tells you, actually, that the mean uh, cycle in a, in a Reynolds average computation of a piston engine doesn't mean much. So it's actually the reason why when you look here, this is, uh, this is all data obtained by PIV in an engine. You know, in a piston engine, you can use a transparent piston and look at uh, the flow from the bottom and reconstruct the velocity fields during PIV. It's an expensive game, but that's a nice one. Uh, you see here that on the mean, you recognize uh, a swirling motion in this engine. But when you look at individual, individual cycles, it's not there. So on average, there is a swirling motion, but instantaneously, difficult to say. Okay? You can have a, a big vortex here, which doesn't appear here. It's the same thing here. And when we started doing larger dissimulation of that, the first one, which was done by Dan Hayworth when he was working at GM, Dan Hayworth simulated with larger dissimulation a, a, simpler, a simple flow like this one. He found out very rapidly that, uh, unlike once, LES was also showing cycles which were different. So you have here different cycles. They are all taken at the same angle, except it's other cycles. You know, you saw we start for 720 degrees. That's two times that, three times, etc. And you see that the flow obtained by larger dissimulation is never the same. 
since those days, uh, that was about 10 years ago, we've been able to do LES now in full engines. Uh, that's an example of an LES we did uh, in 2006. So the experiment is designed to be fully controllable. So there are plenums at the inlet and the outlet. And this is where the combustion chamber is, is. And you see now the LES of this flow. Intake, compression. And now you're going to have exhaust. And you see it's an LES because you see all the structures. You see all these small eddies everywhere. If you would do this computation with once, everything would look smooth and no gradients. And when you do it with large eddy simulation, you capture all the structures. And when you do combustion in a system like this with LES, and you look at, uh, for example, the flame. This is the what we call the flame surface density. We'll talk about it later. It's basically the reaction rate. And you see that this is the same angle, but for different cycles. And you see that each cycle, the flame is very different. And it really tells you that the cycles in the piston engines do not repeat themselves. It's not always the same cycle. Each cycle is different. This one, for example, has not even started burning. Nothing here. While this one is already you know, well advanced. And this will appear here. This one is a big flame now. And this one is late. And if you continue, you know, you will see that uh, this cycle here is almost finished while this one is still burning. And if you plot now the pressure curves, you see that here you have the experiment. And here you have the mean pressure curve, again, the mean value. But you see that around the mean, the variations are very large. And if you plot these cycles obtained by LES, you will see that they, are, they go all over the place here. And each cycle is different. So computing the mean of these cycles is naturally a good idea. Of course, the cost of doing an LES here is pretty large, too. So you have to pay for that. OK. So the situation about 20 years ago was the following. We wanted to develop LES. So we, to do that, we need to be able to uh, keep the large structures we want to diminish the impact of the models, but we want to do that in real configurations, not only in small boxes. And this is really where you need large D simulation. And for your generation, large D simulation, I have no doubt, uh, is going to be the, the, the first tool that will be developed in the future. OK, let me finish now uh, for a few minutes by uh, going into some basic stuff, because uh, um, there will be two parts in my presentations, as you will see. There are pictures and movies, which are easy to read. And then there will be equations, uh, because you need to work also on equations. And uh, so I have to begin at some point. Uh, let me begin by saying that uh, we're talking here about reactions of a fuel with an oxidizer. Oxidizer, as I said, will be air or oxygen. The fuels are listed here. As I said, I will not talk about exotic fuels like solid propellant or things like this. So the simplest fuel you can have is hydrogen, methane, propane. Uh, all this is gas. And then you go into gasoline and kerosene, of course. We're talking about liquids. And those, if you look at this list here, you cover maybe 80 or 90 percent of the, of the cases. So just a word about uh, stoichiometry. You remember that, uh, in general, if you write combustion reaction, you, you use normally write them this way. We say. We have A molecules of A plus B molecules of B burning, giving products and heat. And you define what we call the stoichiometric ratio, which is the product of the molecular weight of B multiplied by the stoichiometric coefficient, normalized by the same thing for A. So it really tells you that for a given reaction, it takes S grams of B to burn one gram of A. An example, if you do the combustion in a rocket engine, H2 plus 1 half O2 gives water. Here, S is 1 half for this coefficient, 32 for oxygen, and 2 for hydrogen. Here, I have done something you should never do. Never write molecular weights in grams. I rem remind you that international units are kilograms. If you, here, it's not a problem because it's a ratio of two masses. But you are, there are cases where if you write it in grams, you will have problems. So here, S is equal to 8. So it really means it takes eight, 8 grams of oxygen to burn 1 gram of hydrogen. And of course, stoichiometry for combustion is very important. Again, it's like cooking. 
if you don't have the, the right amount of butter and of sugar, it's not going to work. So uh, once you know what the S is, you have to define the equivalence ratio, which is the product of S by the fuel mass fraction of A divided by the, the well, let's say the mass fraction of A divided by the mass fraction of B. And the occurrence ratio is a very important quantity for us. Uh, if it's equal to 1, we call it stoichiometric. Uh, if it's less than 1, we call it a lean combustion. We'll have oxidizer left after combustion. For example, there will be oxygen left. And if it's more than 1, we call it a rich combustion. Uh, why do we call it rich? Because basically, we don't pay for oxygen. Normally, there is oxygen everywhere. Uh, so we've been used to say, if you don't if you put more fuel than needed, it's really stupid because you're going to waste it. That's why we call it rich. And then we, when we try to do it smartly, you don't want to put too much fuel. So this is when we call it lean. Now, the important equation uh, for combustion, this is uh, an expression which was proposed initially by Arrhenius again. Arrhenius said that if you look at a reaction like this one, maybe not that one actually, but I'll come back to that, you can write the weight of reaction as a function of the fuel mass fraction, the oxidizer mass fraction, and the temperature. And this quantity here, Ta, is what we call the activation temperature. And A is the pre-exponential constant. And this expression is really the basis of combustion. Uh, the coefficients here, A and Ta, they are given to us by the chemist. Chemists are the guys who worry about that. It's, it's a big pain. Uh, you will see why. Uh, but for us flame people, uh, this is given. A, new A, new B, TA, this is all given. And usually it's given in a format uh, which is, has been specified by the Sandia group 30 years ago. It's called the Chemkin format. And it's, it's something you can obtain on the web. Okay. Why, why is it a complicated task? Well, because in practice, H2 never meets O2 to produce H2O. Okay? That, that never happens. Globally, it happens. But in the process, there are many intermediate steps. And these steps are called chemical kinetics. So for example, uh, here you have an example of what's going on. When H2 meets O2, we know that it's going to produce OH radicals. Okay. And the Chemkin format tells you that for this reaction, the pre-exponential constant A is here, and this is the activation temperature, the activation energy, actually. And uh, the chemist will give you this list here with all the reactions to take into account. I've written here on this board uh, the chemical kinetics for H2O2 because it's the simplest of the world. If I would have to, for example, give you the kinetics for kerosene, we will probably still here tonight, OK? Uh, because uh, for kerosene, we know that today most chemical ki schemes use 10,000 to 15,000 reactions. Okay? So it's, it's getting crazy. Uh, so that's, that's, that's a problem. Uh, and the major problem we're going to have from the CFD point of view is that these kinetics have somehow to be included in our description of what's going on. Now, this uh, form of reaction weights the Arrhenius form calls for troubles. Okay? If you are a mathematician in the room, mathematician will tell you, OK, you have a product here. This is nonlinear. Here you have an ex exponential of 1 minus over t. It's, it's a crazy function. So every time you have nonlinearities, we know you're going to have problems. What is the first problem? The first problem is that if you plot exponential minus ta over t, it looks like this. When it's cold, it's 0 because it's minus Ta divided by 0. It's my exponential minus infinity, 0. And then when you increase temperature, it's still 0. You increase a bit more, it's still 0. And then suddenly it goes up. And that's the typical behavior. In this room, if we mix air and we open a bottle of gas, there's absolutely no danger if no one does something stupid. Uh, if you only have A and B together, the product here will be large. But the exponential of the temperature will be zero, so there will be no combustion. Now, if the temperature goes up a little bit, we're still fine. If the temperature keeps going up, at some point, suddenly, this thing will go. Okay? And that's the problem of combustion, is that uh, it's characterized by the fact that basically everything goes well until 
it burns. And then when it burns, because temperature goes up, this exponential accelerates even more. So when it burns, it, gets, it basically gets fast, extremely rapidly, and then you're in trouble. I just want to conclude here uh, by mentioning something I've said already before. Uh, the quantification of uncertainties. <coughs> Again, you, you have seen here that if you look at the reaction weight like that one, you have one constant here, you have one constant here, and usually chemists also had an expression like T to the power beta here. So usually for one reaction, you have three constants that you need to specify. And that's uh, the, the basic question is that uh, if you have maybe m reactions, we have to specify 3m constant. So if you have 10,000 reactions, you need to specify 30,000 constants. Now you talk to chemists and you tell them, OK, how well do you know the constants? They tell you, oh, yeah, well, 30,000, we know at least 200. 200, we know them well. And what about the others? Well, the others, we guess them. Okay. How do you guess them? Well, we look you know, at this, this molecule plus this molecule, and uh, this reaction now looks like this one, so the weights must be the same, or not very different. not sure which reaction should be included or not. And that's, that's really a chemist's problem. They, they are not sure that they have all the reactions. And this is why even for hydrogen, you can find many, many different schemes. And uh, all of them are right, if you want, some, somehow. But certainly, some, some schemes are better. The problem is that we don't do enough tests. We don't have enough measurements to say which one is the best. When we qualify uh, a chemical scheme, we look at one flame speed, a curve of auto-ignition times. But there are, if you have enough constants, there are many ways you can have these things and still have different schemes. So today, it's actually, the, the, this is a valid question. This is a question for chemists. They cannot tell us which scheme is the best. So if you look at methane, for example, you have the GRI Grimec mechanisms. You know, every two years, there's a new one. So, they keep working. So the, the answer to your question is that today we don't know. We, we don't know. This is why, actually, you know, the, if you go to the symposium, the commission symposium, the largest community is kinetics. There, because there are so many people trying to, to work on this problem, kinetics. Unsolved problem. This is what, you know, if you want, that's the nice thing about turbulent combustion. There are so many unsolved problems that you know you're not going to retire before you solve them. You will have work for a long time. It's not, it's not a field where problems are solved. Okay. See you this afternoon then.